Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome on this special celebratory edition of Live in London. We'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate you and send our congratulations to you and your family and also the Imam of our time on this auspicious occasion of the Waladat of Sayyidina Zainab alayhi salam. On today's show, we'll have our discussion. Later, we'll be joined by our special guest, Sayyid Haydar Jizani, to hear his beautiful voice and some recitation on Sayyidina Zainab. And also, we have a competition that we are running throughout today's show. For your chance to win a special prize, Tell us the answer to this question. Name another name or a title for Sayyidah Zainab. A name or a title associated to Sayyidah Zainab. Contact us on 0203-515-0199 with your answer. For you to have a chance to win, this prize is right in front of me if you can see it. It's actually from Karbala. And it was part, it's a marble piece, part of the shrine of Abba Abdul Al Hussein. Make sure you give your answers in to the telephone line. And make sure that you participate, call, and also you can get us on the WhatsApp with your answers. Sayyidah Zainab was born in the fifth year of Hijrah in Medina. She grew up to be one of the greatest and most memorable um, humanitarians and social reformists that the Arabs have ever seen. Her sermon in Kufa and in Damascus showed a display of knowledge and eloquence none had seen before. But it wasn't a surprise to people like us, for we know her father is Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, and we know her mother is Sayyidat Nisa Ali Alameen, Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. But what impact did these two have as parents on the young Sayyidah Zainab? Sayyidah Zainab as a child, what did she learn and what did she teach? That she grew up to become this, this warrior of words. And what can we take from her legacy that she has left behind? Let us discuss with Sayyid Amar Naqshwani. Assalamu alaikum Sayyid. Wa alaikum as salam How are you Allah. Alhamdulillah, very well. Congratulations to everybody on this auspicious occasion, the birth of the Lady of Light. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you and bless you all to go to her ziyarah soon, inshallah. Inshallah. Yeah. Let's kick off with the childhood of Sayyidah Zainab and the relationship she had with her grandfather, her father, her mother, her brothers. What, what was it like for young Sayyidah Zainab? It's not the easiest uh, childhood that anyone's ever going to have. And that's something which I think many people need to realize that I think sometimes we think Ahl al-Bayt went through easy periods in their life where there weren't many tests, there weren't many trials or tribulations. The reality is when you look at the life of Sayyidah Zainab salam, she literally becomes an orphan uh, at the age of five. Uh, you've got a very close relationship between herself and uh, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, and this relationship can be seen in a few of the anecdotes which discuss uh, the relationship between the father and the daughter. One famous anecdote being when the Imam is teaching her, for example, how to count. And there's this beautiful relationship that exists between the two of them. And he says to her, you know, Zainab, say one. And she says one. And then he says to her, say two. And she continues to say one. And he says to her, no, say two. And she says one. And he says to her, well, why don't you say two? And she says, the house where we are taught to say there is only one. We're not used to saying two. Subhanallah. So already there's a wonderful relationship between her father and herself, on another occasion, her father really teaches us about how, you know, there should be a softness with one's daughter. There are many fathers in the world today who have a softness for their daughter, but then there are some fathers who prefer that the tribal value or the tribal customs or the cultural customs override, for example, their love and their warmth for their daughters. Today you find, for example, some fathers who claim to be Muslims, who will turn around and say that we will not allow our daughters, for example, to go and study at college or to study at university or to find a job in the public sphere. And the sadness is that these people claim to follow a man like Imam Ali ibn Talib salam, who had a very soft and tender approach with his beloved daughter. So you find on one occasion he says to her, he says to her, Zainab, who do you love? She says, Daddy, I love you. Then he says to her, and who else do you love? She said, Daddy, I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says to her, but you cannot have two loves in one heart. 
She says, Daddy, because of people like you, I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you see at that tender young age, there is this relationship between the father and the daughter. Wonderful relationship. And even with her mother, you notice at that young age, there is a lot to be learned from her mother. The spiritual aspect, as in after her mother dies, when Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is narrated to have returned home, the moment he comes back home, he notices that while the house is in a state of sadness, it's quiet, he looks around the house until he finds Zainab on the prayer mat of her mother, saying that this is where I used to be sitting next to my mother when she was alive in the middle of the night. Father Wan Zahra salam, was known to be awake mm -hmm. during the night. And so, she learns this from her mother. There's the political aspect as well, which she gets from her mother, where we find the famous sermon that she was alive at the time, the sermon known as Al-Khutbah Al-Fadakiyah. Sayyidah Zainab was alive at the time. And it's no surprise later on when we see the sermon that takes place uh, in the land of Sham. It's no surprise whatsoever when you know that Zainab was brought up having seen the eloquence of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. The bravery of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. So there was a real closeness between Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam and Sayyidah Zainab. Imam Amir al Muyan Sayyidah Zainab. I just expect from a father, daughter, mother, daughter relationship. But was it an easy childhood? Some people will make you think, well, you know what? Do Ahlul Bayt go through the same trials we do? If I've lost my father at a young age, for example, have any members of the Ahlul Bayt gone through this difficult period? Mm -hmm. Look at Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. Five years of age, she becomes an orphan. Her mother, when she passes away, it's a very difficult period for that household. Don't imagine that Sayyidah Zainab was brought up in the lap of luxury. Yes, if you're around Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, no doubt that is a form of a lap of luxury. But on the other hand, every girl yearns to have their mother's presence. To lose your mother at that young age and to recover from that loss. There are many who may grow up as orphans. Her grandfather grew up as an orphan, but he recovered from that loss. Sometimes the biggest test is not having the loss, but rather can you recover? Can you maintain the principles of those who raised you in the midst of adversity? So you find that she recovers having seen the death of her mother. She recovers in her childhood, but without a doubt, her father plays a pivotal role in giving her that strength and compassion in those difficult times. Yeah. Insightful, very nice. What about today? You were mentioning the relationship between the fathers and, and, and their daughters. If we want our daughters to become modern day Zainabs, how should our parents, what should the parents be teaching their children? How should they be raising them? Well, I think I have to give credit to the fact that a lot of the parents in the Western world have done an amazing job anyway with their with their daughters. I think there's always this impression that the parents in the Western world have not lived up to the expectations of what Ahlul Bayt wanted, alayhi However, when I look around, when I travel, for example, whether it is in England or in America, or for example, in Canada, Australia, our daughters have done an amazing job in preserving the legacy of Sayyidah Zainab salam in different ways. We sometimes are our worst critics in our community. We love to try and find ways of attacking the members of our community. Whereas on the contrary, if you look around at, for example, Ahlul Bayt societies yeah. in this country, university societies that are named after the Ahlul Bayt, Look how many of our sisters represent Sayyidah Zainab salam by organizing lectures, organizing seminars, organizing programs where knowledge is gained. As in what is living the legacy of Zainab salam, but to ensure that the legacy and the heritage of the Prophet peace be upon him and his family and the Quran is preserved in society. If I look in this country, whether you travel from, for example, London and you go towards, you know, you go up north, you find that we have preserved the legacy of Sayyidah Zainab in the most amazing way. 
In Canada, for example, I lectured in the Afghani community in Canada, and amongst the organizers who had invited me was one of the ladies of the community. Already they're doing a magnificent job trying to preserve the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt Likewise, you have, for example, in Australia, many of the programs they have in Muharram, in the English language, you'll find that the MC of the program, in many cases, is somebody who is representing Sayyidah Zainab salam with her social modesty, with her knowledge, with her physical modesty. And so wherever we're looking at the moment, I think we're doing a great job in preserving that legacy. When it comes to, for example, an issue of oppression in the society, I think we find that some of our sisters have spoken out against the injustices and demonstrated against the injustices a lot more than our brothers. When it comes to gaining knowledge in the mosques, a lot of our sisters are double and sometimes triple the attendance as the brothers in terms of their passion and their commitment to learning. So when a person tells me, how can we? The first answer I'm going to give is by saying we already are doing a brilliant job. Believe you me, there are sisters in the West who are more knowledgeable about the Ahlul Bayt than their cousins in the Middle yeah. East, for example. Mashallah. There are some whose hijab is even better than their cousins in the Middle East, for example. Or their cousins in India or in Pakistan, for example. Definitely. So already a lot of the sisters are preserving that legacy, be it in the spreading of knowledge, dissemination of knowledge, be it in being politically active, be it in serving the community, Many of our sisters are doing amazing work on all these fronts. Yeah. Excellent. Sayyid, Sayyid Zainab is known as Alima Ghayr Mu'allim and yeah. Fahima Ghayr Mufahim. What, what do these mean? I mean, what are they trying to indicate and describe about Sayyid Zainab? Yeah, these are the famous words of Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam. Imam Zain al Abidin, in his praise of Sayyidah Zainab, his auntie, said in the famous lines, Amma Zainab, anti alima ghayru mu'allama, wa fahima ghayru mufahama. My auntie Zainab, you are learned without having been taught, and a scholar without requiring explanation. These are very deep lines from Imam Zain al-Abidin salam. I personally believe the greatest accolade ever given to Sayyidah Zainab salam was these lines from Imam Zain al-Abidin salam. That my auntie Zainab, you are learned without having been taught. Someone asked the question, how can someone be learned without having been exactly. taught? And the scholars have all tried in their own way to try and understand what is the meaning of these words from Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam? What is the Imam intent on saying? We know that even the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, there were certain things the Imams learnt from the previous Imam. There are other things the Imams acquired from inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, you have two forms of knowledge. Maybe there's other forms which we can discuss on another occasion. Yes. But there are two forms of knowledge when it comes to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt One form of knowledge is what? Acquiring. Is for example acquiring. Let's say mm -hmm. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, says to Imam al Hassan, the heart of a youth is like an uncultivated piece of land. Whatever I throw on it, whatever you throw on it, it accepts. Therefore, I try to Make sure that I mold your heart before it's hardened. So you learned from my example and applied them into your life. Imam Ali salam, would give many lessons, would give many examples, would give many pieces of wisdom to Imam al-Hasan salam. Imam al-Hasan salam, would also give towards Imam al Hussein. We talk of this type of knowledge as kasb. Yes. Okay. This type of knowledge an Imam inherits from another Imam. And that one Imam passes it on to the other. Then there is a second form of knowledge. And that is when you receive inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the amount of obedience you have shown Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
becomes what? Becomes the voice by which you speak. The ears by which you hear. You know, there are many of these traditions which are known as, uh, in many of our circles, we call them Hadith Qudsi. Hadith Qudsi, what is it? Hadith Qudsi is a tradition which shows us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words outside of the Holy Quran. When you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words outside of the Holy Quran, what are we meaning? We're meaning that many people will take verses from the Holy Quran and these are the words of Allah. There are also narrations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which are not in the Holy Quran. The conversation with Moses, you could say. For example, so you have some of these traditions will mention that God's saying, my servant, I am the one who says to something, be and it will be. Obey me in what I've ordered you. And I will say, allow you to say to something, be and it will be. Yes. I am the rich who does not become poor. Obey me in what I've ordered you. I will make you rich and never becoming poor. You find therefore that on this level of knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inspire that creation. And that inspiration is because of their obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, they reach a level where that person, when they speak, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's inspiration behind their words. And so when Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam describes his auntie Zainab, he's saying that you are a scholar. Yes, you are learned without having been taught. There were certain things that she acquired from the imams around her, no doubt. From Imam al Hussein, from Imam al Hassan, from Imam Amir al Muminin, there are things that she acquired knowledge from them. But you can also get to a stage where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to inspire you. You look at that sermon in Sham. That sermon in Sham is not something anyone can just pull off. You would have had to have been raised in the house of purity, the house of knowledge. And then after that, not just the house of purity and knowledge, but also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to inspire you to have that knowledge at that moment. At the same time, Fahima غَيْرُ مُفَهَّمَ She's able to understand not just the world of knowledge, but understand every situation at every moment. The depths of that situation. She's able to maintain her discipline at all times. That again comes from a certain form of knowledge that is given to her. And that form of knowledge that's given to her, she's seen trials and tribulations where she's seen the way her parents understood that trial, the way her brother Imam al Hassan understood his trial, the way Imam al Hussein salam understood his trial. So you found that whenever she would see an issue, she'd be able to understand it without requiring anyone else to explain the issue to her. Yes. Fantastic. Sayyidina, without a doubt, Sayyidina Zayna was known as the, one of the most knowledgeable women in her time. Are there any notable uh, knowledgeable women that we have in sh Shia history? There are many who are inspired by Sayyidah Zainab salam, but I don't think they get the credit they deserve in our communities, sadly. Uh, we've had many great female scholars of the religion of Islam. And sadly, in my opinion, They've been left behind the scenes. They hardly get any mention. You find, for example, in Iran in the last hundred years, there were two famous mujtahidas, Nusrat Amin and Zahra Sufati. These are famous mujtahidas in Iran. These are ladies who reached the highest level of knowledge in Iran, in the seminary, where they actually reached the level where they were giving ijazas. Wow. But nobody mentions their knowledge, no one discusses it. It's as if when males have achieved great knowledge in Islam, all of them get the mention. I remember Shahid al Awwal, the author of Al Lum al Dimashqiyya. We know very well mm -hmm. that nobody can become a mujtahid unless they study Al Lum al Dimashqiyya. Shahid al Awwal, amongst the backbones in his life, was his wife, Um Ali, and their daughter, Fatima. The wife, Um Ali, and the daughter, Fatima, were amongst the most learned female scholars in the history of the religion of Islam. And I shouldn't say female scholars, amongst the most learned scholars in the history of the religion. But sadly, you don't see anyone mentioning them. 
You find, for example, Muhammad Taqi Majlisi had a daughter by the name of Amina, married to Ayatollah Mazandarani. And yet you find nobody mentions that this daughter was amongst the greatest scholars in the history of Al Muhammad. So you've got within the history of the school of Ahlul Bayt, many ladies who were inspired by Sayyidah Zainab السلام, to reach those highest levels of knowledge. Sadly, in our communities, we don't praise the ladies who have reached the highest levels of knowledge. We don't write their biographies, the biographies of the narrators. Mind you, even the wives of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, such as Hamida, the wife of Imam al-Sadiq, so much knowledge, hardly ever discussed. But so when you find, for example, you know, the likes of Shahid al-Awwal's wife, his daughter, Ayatollah Mazandarani's wife, you know, the likes of, uh, you know, Nusrat Amin and others, these are amazing scholars who were, who were inspired by Sayyidina Zainab alayhi salam, but sadly do not get the mention they deserve. So why can't they, these ladies, become mar uh, marjas and, and why can we not take fiqh issue and rulings from them? I think there's a social problem why they cannot become a marja. And I personally don't have an issue with it. When I'm looking at the arguments for why a woman cannot become a marja, I must admit the arguments to me, when I read them of the respected ulama, I must admit when I look at some of those, I, I think to myself that these are arguments where the backdrop of them is really a Middle Eastern worldview on a woman. I remember the great scholar Shamsuddin of Lebanon has a fantastic discussion on a woman becoming a marja. We know the difference between a mujtahid and a marja. Every marja is a mujtahid. Yes. But not every mujtahid is a marja. marja. A mujtahid is someone who, for example, has finished the seminary levels known as uh, al-muqaddamat and al-sutuh and bahth al-kharij. And amongst the top scholars of the time may have given that person an ijazah of ijtihad. Yes. A woman and a man in Islam can both become mujtahids. Indeed. Yes, the man would be the mujtahid and the woman would be mujtahida. So, for example, when we mention Nusrat Amin, Zahra Sufati, these are mujtahidas. Someone asked, well, why can't they become maraja? Why is it when we look at the list of the maraja we have in the school of Ahlul Bayt, that list is mainly composed of males? It's only males. So, for example, if you look at the names, let's say Ayatollah Muhsin al Hakim, Ayatollah Muhammad Baqar al Sadr, Ayatollah al Khomeini, Ayatollah al Khoi, Ayatollah Sistani. You're looking at these names and you're thinking to yourself, this is mainly the names of males. Are you telling me that there are no females at that level in Najaf or Qum? Because we know very well, if, I'm, if I've got a legal issue, a corporate legal issue, or an issue on human rights or immigration law in London, when I go to see the top barrister, or in America, the top lawyer, I don't care if they're a man or a woman, Correct. I just want them to win the case. Correct. When I, for example have an issue with my accounts, I don't care if you're a male accountant or a female accountant, I just want you to resolve my accounts, audit my accounts, find me as many loopholes as possible in my accounts. If for example when I'm looking at going to the top hospital in London and say that my sibling or my wife for example has got an issue, what am I going to do? Do I care if a woman or a man is the chief consultant? In that situation, I need one of them to help. Why is it that rationally, if you look at the path of the rationals in the world today, when we go for the person of the top field, we don't care if it's a male or female. But when it comes to the Muslim world, when it comes to the mufti or the qadi or the chief judge or the marja, it always has to be a male. Now, some try to posit certain arguments. Some said, for example, if you look within the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-rijal qawwamoon ala nisa Men are qawwamoon over women. Now, this word qawwamoon, some try to argue qawwamoon means authority. 
So men have authority over women. So they said if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says that men have authority over women, what does that mean? That means that men have to always be the top. Because Allah has said in the Quran that الرجال قوامون على النساء. Shams al-Din replies interestingly by saying قوامون doesn't necessarily mean authority. قوامون means they are the ones who protect or maintain the woman because the financial obligation on them is they have to maintain their wives. As you know in Islam, a woman does not have to work. In Islam, a woman does not have to work. And even whatever she earns from working belongs to her goes to her, there is no obligation on her for her to have to work. We know very well that the man is the one who has to maintain. So Shams al-Din replies by saying something interesting. He says that if you're saying now that a woman cannot become a marja because the Quran says al-rijal qawwamun ala nisa but al-rijal qawwamun doesn't mean authority. Qawwamun means maintainers. Men are to maintain their wives. What that got to do with authority? That's number one. A second argument is that some of them said that there's a tradition within the, whole, within the world of hadith. And that tradition says that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family said, whoever leaves their affairs in the hands of a woman, uh, yes, which nation leaves its affairs in the hands of a woman, that nation will perish. Now, some said, look, if the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family said, if a nation leaves its affairs in the hands of a woman, that nation will perish. That means a woman can never ever be the highest authority. Again, what's the reply? There's a reply that can be there. And the reply is very clear. That was in reference to the daughter of Kisra, the king of Persia, who had ruined her dad's kingdom. So when the Prophet said, you leave the nation in the hands of a woman, that's contextual, not absolute. Then there was a third argument that Imam al-Sadiq sometimes would say, any of the legal issues that you have, take it to one of our men. So the person turned around and said, some of the maraja said, if Imam al-Sadiq says when you have a legal issue, take it to one of our men. That means only men can answer legal issues. Now I ask you, Sayyid Muhsin, when Imam al-Sadiq says, take one of our legal issues to one of our men, does he literally mean to a man? Or what could he mean? Take it to one of our? In general, one of our general. People, people. Take it to one of our people. Our people means what? If Imam al-Sadiq, Shia. Shia. So therefore, when a person says that Imam al-Sadiq says in his hadith that if you have a certain issue, take it to one of our men, take it to one of our men doesn't necessarily mean take it to literally a man. Take it to one of the people of knowledge. Mm. Therefore, these were the arguments that were normally given. And then some said, well, a woman cannot be in the middle of men. How is she going to become a marja? We're going to have to go and visit her as men. <laughs> and when we visit her as men, if the marja is a woman, there's going to be a problem. Firstly, even when the marja is a man, you can just about get to visit him. Secondly, even if the marja is a woman, are you telling me that in your daily life you've, you have no way of interacting with the woman with respect and with modesty? Or is it that the man's mind is always going towards a direction that how can I sit alone with a woman? If that woman is a lady of knowledge, she's a lawyer, accountant, someone in finance, I'm having a normal discussion with them, let alone someone who will be the height of God consciousness. And then how did say the Khadija herself have discussions in the world of business in Mecca? How did Fatima al-Zahra come out on the event of Mubahala when the Quran said, فَمَنْ حَاجَكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ The Quran said on the day of Mubahala, let Fatima come. And so when Fatima al-Zahra came to the meet the Christians, couldn't God have said that a woman should never be around men? A woman should be staying in the household. Indeed. So, when a person today says, yes, the woman can become mujtahidas but not maraja, I think a lot of the arguments are Middle Eastern-centric arguments. And what do I mean by that? 
If a lot of these conclusions are being reached by Najaf and Qom, then yes, Najaf and Qom has only seen woman in one perspective. Yes, in some cases, that woman's face has never been shown in her life. In other cases, she's got no chance of working if she comes from one of the most religious families in Najaf or Qom. The idea of going out and becoming one day a lawyer or a banker when your dad's a marja is impossible. I think 1% of a marja's conclusion on these issues is definitely their childhood or definitely the world which they lived around. So today when someone's saying, well, woman should never be able to become maraja, the woman should only be a mujtahid or a mujtahida, I think those arguments can easily be replied back to. Yeah. Excellent. Sayyidna, Sayyidna Zainab was known for giving lessons in her own house. Do you feel today in our community such a tradition is neglected and people really associate knowledge with the mosque and the hawza and that's where it should belong. There's no need for any education in the household. No, I think, I think knowledge is encouraged in our households a great deal. And I think if you're looking at many of the cities where you have lovers of Ahlul Bayt, I think the women gather together on a weekly basis to gain knowledge in the world of Quran, in the world of Hadith, in the world of, um, you know, in the world of theology, in the world of history. I believe that Sayyidah Zainab's legacy of, you know, giving classes and lessons and houses has been maintained brilliantly by our communities. As in wherever I go in the world, I always hear that the ladies are doing Hawza courses. I hear that the ladies are the first to sign up for um, night courses on Islam, tafsir classes. I hear that the ladies are always gathering together to gain knowledge. So I don't think we've really neglected it. I do certainly, however, hope that the generation that's under, I would say, 35, I do hope they can try and gather together as much as possible and not just rely on the mosques to do the programs. Yes, it's great if the mosques have a program, but try once a month to try and gather everyone together. Sometimes the gathering is not just about gaining knowledge. It's also to bring that sense of walaya with one another. Not wilaya, walaya. Wilaya is the authority of Ahlul Bayt. Walaya is the love to be shown by the lovers of Ahlul Bayt with one another. And I think that that age group under 35, I know sometimes it's difficult when you go to the mosque and some of the mosques are very traditional in their outlook. But that shouldn't stop you gathering together. Uh, my first lectures over 17 years ago were in gatherings in houses. Given your age, yeah. Yeah, Give gatherings in houses, gatherings um, in the back of garages, sheds. Um, you know, you might see it today and you may see big gatherings and mosques and so on. But we all started somewhere where we had a camaraderie amongst each other. Humble beginnings. Okay. So... I think that we should praise a lot of our sisters and a lot of our mothers whose yearning for knowledge is unbelievable. But at the same time, let's try and make sure that we try and gather on a regular basis and not only rely on the mosques. Fantastic. Inshallah, we encourage the whole community to um, have small gatherings in their houses and to increase the love of the Ahlul Bayt. Sayyidina, um, Isma Sughra, what is it? And can we achieve it or... Is it exclusive to certain people only? Yeah, Asma Sughra is normally something which is mentioned in, in relation to Sayyidah Zainab uh, That you've got the classic definition of Asma, infallibility. Where a person who has the Qudra, the ability to commit a sin, chooses not to because of their respect of God and the recognition of the consequences of the act and in Shi'ism we are of the belief that the infallibles or the error free are the prophets and the imams of Ahlul Bayt some mention that there are certain personalities who can reach a minor level of Isma imagine now you have a marja who you respect very highly that marja who you respect very highly if someone said to you I saw him do this. Your first reaction will be, no way. If they were to mention something negative about him, your first reaction would be, no, no way. way. 
because you've in a way afforded a certain level of infallibility to them because of their obedience and their respect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, when people come to define Asmat al-Sughra, Asmat al-Sughra, what is the definition? The definition is that there are certain people because of their obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah bestows upon them a grace where he protects them from the world of sin. And Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, Abal Fadl, Al Abbas alayhi salam, others are of those who reached a level in their life where you could tell that their words became the Quran only, their actions became the Quran. You know, they were a reflection of the Quran and of the Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, in every single thing that they did. So, therefore, when someone's saying Asbat al Sughra, the difference between the main concept of infallibility is that one, for example, is showered upon that personality from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In some cases, from the beginning of their life, it's mentioned, for example, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, right from the beginning. And some of the theologians say, well, if Isa is bestowed with Asma from the beginning, where he says, Inni Abdullah al Kitab likewise the prophets of God as well. And so those prophets and those Imams would have it bestowed upon them by God because of their mission. But Asma al Sughra, you'll find that this could be something which is bestowed upon certain personalities later in their lives because of their continuous obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we mentioned Hadith al Qudsi. That I am the one who says to something, be and it will be. Obey me in what I've ordered you. I'll make you say to something, be and it will be. Yeah. Excellent, Sayyidina. Sayyidina, I do believe you were on some travels recently and you just come back. And it's in relation to Sayyidina Zainab. Could yeah. you please comment on your experience and, and, and how was it for you? Yeah, it was a great honor to be, you know, to visit the shrine of Sayyidina Zainab alayhi salam. It's been six years since I visited the shrine. And we all know sadly of the wars that have taken place in the Middle East in that period. But Alhamdulillah, I was honored to visit the shrine. And there was a sense of real sadness um, alongside that joy. Very eerie feeling. Knowing that you're in an area where you lost many innocent lives. You lost many good people. And also when you're looking around you and you see rubble and you see concrete broken everywhere, roads broken. You see, for example, orphans, widows, people who had no medical supplies whatsoever, because when I went, I went in my position as the ambassador for the Zahra Trust. And the Zahra Trust, its main aim was to try and look after the medical needs of orphans and widows at the moment in that area. And believe you me, the number of displaced orphans and widows around the shrine of Sayyidah Zainab salam is something unbelievable. Believe you me, it breaks the heart. But the shrine itself is in good, um, good condition. And at the same time, we went to the grave of Sayyidah Ruqayya salam, And that's still in great condition. And I had the honor of going inside the Dharih. And it really is a touching feeling. And I hope that in the near future, things will be safer for all. I can't really say at this moment that it's safe. You know, some might want me to say that it's safe, but I can't say that it's safe at the moment. But I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in the near future, it will be safer for everybody to be able to visit. And that inshallah, this time next year, we can celebrate the wilada of Sayyidah Zainab next to her grave, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. We're going to take a short break now. Inshallah, after the break, we'll be joined by our special guest, Sayyid Haider Jizani, who would, inshallah, bless us with his voice on this celebratory occasion, this auspicious occasion of Sayyid Zainab's Wilayah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jamal al Murtaza Jamal al Murtaza.
المرتضى فيه المعاني قد أورثتها زينب الحوراء هي أم في فضلها ونقائها هي مهجة السبطين والزهراء هي أمها في فضلها ونقائها هي مهجة السلطين والزهراء في خلقها وجمالها كالمصطفى هي كوثر الإحسان والآلاء هي أخت من هي أخت من ملك الفرات وماؤه هي أخت من ملك الفرات وماؤه صلوا لذكرها مع العلياء الله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And as you can see, you've been joined by our special guest, the Green Eyed Beauty. Say, ladies and gentlemen, Salaam alaikum. Salaam alaikum. How are you this evening? It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and especially amongst the, the beautiful Sayyid himself, God and bless. of course another Sayyid, which is Noor and Ala Noor. Masha. Just a quick <laughs> reminder to all the viewers: we are still taking calls for the competition, and the uh, and the question for the competition is. Name another name or a title for Sayyidah Zainab. Any name or title attributed to Sayyidah Zainab. And please contact us on 0203 515 for your chance to win the prize, uh, which will be, and the winner will be announced later on this evening in uh, the end, towards the end of the show. Sayyid Jizani, how are you? Hello, Sayyid. Looking Habibi. beautiful as always, mashallah. Sayyidah, tell us what Sayyidah Zainab means to you, how she inspires you, how, how she. Um, Cool, you know, inspires you to write poetry, inspires you to gain knowledge, to help in our community? Well, I say that say Zainab uh, is a lot more than a simple question and a simple answer. She's um, nothing that you can think of within, you know, 10 seconds of giving me a warning. Are you going to shoot a question <laughs> like that? But say that Zainab inspires us all, to be honest, to, uh, through her love <clears throat> to our brothers, to, through her service to our brothers, through the loyalty the patience she she shown, and everything that you need in a day to day life, I think, uh, mirrors of her actions and from her re reflection. So I mean, say the Zainab, of course, is uh, is, is is an inspiration, uh, more than just uh, what a few words can say. But Alhamdulillah, shukur, we have uh, been blessed by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for such um, a beautiful light that shines from her. To all of Shi'at Amir al Mu'mineen, mm. and Alhamdulillah, wa shukur, we have been blessed to celebrate uh, her birth in such a day. And you know, we have also been blessed by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for a beautiful voice which you have, you know, bestowed us with. You Can you please, please recite <coughs> something for us, yes, please? Of course, inshallah. <coughs> You taught us to be patient, but to see your shrine, I'm impatient. You're the doctor for my wounds, and I'm your patient. In you, I seek refuge. O oh, daughter of Ali, Zainab, 
You are the light that shines from Hussein to Abbas. Zainab, only through your eyes the gates of heaven I pass. With your shafa'ah, any test I'll pass. Give us your blessings, O oh lover of Ali Zainab. Your name is in my heart engraved. And I ask up in my qabur, the light will be engraved with you. With you, the sun will shine in my grave. I beg you from night till day. I know you and your family are giving. Me and my family for your sake are given i beg you by abbas's hands that was given to bless me and give me shafa'ah on the day of judgment Allah Muhammad. Muhammad. <laughs> just like that uh, okay this is uh, the last one Insha'Allah, it's been written by my brother Nuri Saldar. Um, wait, 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 tell us a bit more about your recitation. Tell us about how you got involved and how difficult is it to keep up with the mulu that comes year after year after year to get new material and to write new stuff. Yani, of course, it's inspiration from, uh, from the Imma, it's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, be a servant of the servants of Abu Abdullah al-Hussein. And what inspired me since a young kid was everything around me. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I have a father who uh, his life revolves around the service of Imam Hussein and serving his servants. And Alhamdulillah, shukur, we had older people than us in our, in our community as inspiration to us, such as Sayyid Ammar. Right. Since a very young age, we used to listen to his lectures. Um, and Alhamdulillah, we've been, we've been inspired by many uh, in our community which uphold the service of Imam Hussein. Uh, me being young, growing up in this country, there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of easy routes for you to stray. But you know, it's the blessing of the Ahlul Bayt which keeps you together, which keeps you in the line of uh, Imam Hussein, inshallah. And uh, you know, these poems, alhamdulillah, the poets provide you. Uh, and sometimes you get like a, a sudden a sudden motion where you you I never write poems, but subhanallah, today in the car I was writing as a don't write and drive, <laughs> but uh, I was uh, I literally written. The poem I just recited, I wrote it in the car driving to here, oh, to the studio. Yeah. So you were driving and and, and, and writing and writing uh, and breaking which the I law. Shouldn't do. It's not a very good example to set, but um, you know these 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 things they come as a blessing to you, honestly. And alhamdulillah, Shukur, we have this kind of blessing for us. Alhamdulillah. Would you be as so kind? Inshallah, yes. <clears throat> not veiled by veil. By art, by the heavens themselves Beneath the old garments worn So the poor don't feel torn So gracious to the poor We wish we were poor ourselves And that our clothes were Outworn that to despair we have sworn, so we can feel the safety of her generosity. Yearn it, the high and mighty, encompassed by Zainab. Ali's beauty was born. But here it is born again. The conqueror of Khaybar finds his victor victory within her. A connection between them that no one can explain. 
the mighty Ali Haydar made soft by his own daughter and like him she beams of might a second lady of light and his day and noon and night encompassed by Zainab MashaAllah MashaAllah Masalli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Read another one That's it That's what I said Read one of Ali Fadl's ones Huh? Ali Fadl's ones Don't worry I'm joking I'm joking That's it Say Zizani Tell us how difficult is it sometimes to recite in English for English is not a Middle Eastern language nor is it a language that has um, been touched by Islam the way you know uh, we, we, we want it to help with the culture it doesn't have roots in, in the Middle East how have you come across those challenges and how have you overcome those challenges? Uh, well for me I started reciting Arabic only and uh, some parts in Farsi and then uh, English just uh, kind of flowed through. It's difficult to recite English with Arabic melodies. But Alhamdulillah, not Alhamdulillah, but like being raised in the West, you start to be familiar as where you are, where you walk, with the, with the, with the Western kind of melodies and stuff like that. You know what they, what they ex expect. So it comes out naturally. I mean, um, this particular poem that Nuri read, um, it was written into a um, Arabic Latmiya kind of style, or an Ashid kind of style. And uh, you just kind of like flow along with the words, like I literally done the melody on the spot, but you see it and uh, you just you just see how many syllables it carries and stuff like that. And it just kind of connects, hopefully it connects. Um, I mean, you know, English itself has is very important because now um, being inspired, a lot of people, they ha they ha it's very easy for them to listen to music. It's very easy to them to, um, you know, t something normal to turn on the radio and listen to something. So I think my advice to a lot of people and to myself as well is uh, improve on the English, make the, make English push forward uh, as much as it is with Arabic and stuff like that, okay. and try to develop Westernized tunes mm -hmm. to suit to 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 be like a, a bedil, to be like a comparison to to what they usually listen to. But then they got it, but it's in about Ahl al Bayt, and it's a completely yeah. different style. Hassan, thank oh, you very much. Thank you very much. Say that. Any final thoughts on today's discussion? And uh, also, you know, we'd love, love to mention that to the viewers, that if they can, to go um, see, say, the Zainab in Cairo. There is also a ziyara there. So, any final thoughts on that? Well, firstly, we're we're honoured to have said Haidar Jazani uh, come join us, and we're proud when we see the youth of London doing so well in different fields in the service of God and you know seeing Sayyid Haidar and his development you know it's a great source of pride for all of the lovers of Ahlul Bayt so God bless him and allow him to continue in his service and I think you know once again the main thing is for us when it comes to the Ahlul Bayt generally and Sayyid Zainab in particular is not just to treat them with emotion but to also build our intellect alongside their traditions and apply them into our life you know I think there are a lot of people who love Sayyidah Zainab, but maybe have never sat at home to read her sermons, you know, be it Kufa, be it Sham, and maybe reflect upon the message within these sermons. And the same goes with Imam al Hussein. Many people know he got killed on the 10th of Muharram, and I think 90% of the Shia have never read one supplication that he recited on the 10th of Muharram. So I would hope that looking at the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt, salam, rather than just having the emotional attachment, a nice balance is something we can take from a wonderful night like tonight. Thank you, Thank you very much. I do believe that uh, the lines are now closed for our competition and we're just waiting for the technical team now to bring us um, some uh, the, the winners and, and inshallah we will do the prize draw on Facebook. Uh, but for now, we're going to have to um, end the show here. A big congratulations to all of you on tonight's uh, auspicious occasion and inshallah join us again on Friday as we continue our discussions on Asalt al-Hukuk with Dr. Amar Nakshwani. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.